All right. Now, welcome, welcome. So we come to the, uh, as some would say, the end of Easter, right? It's over, and Jesus said, it is finished. He gave up his spirit, and then he rose from the dead. But of course, we need to remember, we can look backwards, and this was to fulfill a variety of prophecies in the Old Testament. That Messiah would come, and he would, most importantly, in Isaiah 53, die for the sins of many, and be the justification for their sin. However, going back even farther into the garden and the coming of the evil one, in the face of sin and the direct rebellion and the challenge to his goodness, God said, instead of destroying them, I make them a promise. One day I will defeat the serpent. And I will provide for them in the meantime what they need, and I will protect them from living in their sinful state forever. And so history began and moved forward. And as we come into the New Testament, the ultimate expression of God's heart is Jesus, the sinless one who became our sin, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So the, the Lord would then look at us as having perfect righteousness, being declared right in his sight, perfectly just, perfectly perfect. I mean, imagine that, all the way from the garden that was perfect, we messed it up, and then God has a plan to take care of that. And the reason is because, as a friend of mine wrote in a book that's coming out, he talked about the greatness of God. And he said, he is the greatest person in the universe. The expression of all, or expression of absolute eternal perfection, bound by no limitations of time, space, power, intellect, or depth of character. He is everywhere, all the time, meaning he does not divide and therefore diminish himself in order to cover all the ground necessary to be present in and rule the universe and everything beyond it. He therefore makes no distinction between a parsec or a plank. In other words, there is no place all of him is not. Wow. That's the God we worship because of Easter. So, as someone once said, Saturday, right? We got, we got Good Friday, we got Holy Easter Sunday. Saturday is the longest day, for it stretches between the certainty of sorrow and the hope of deliverance. Between the full exposure of human cruelty and the full disclosure of God's glory. In the end, we live not in the darkened shadow of Good Friday, but on ground that has been illuminated by the dawn of Easter Sunday. Ooh, that's good. That's good. Well, it should be. He's, he used to teach English. So there you go. So that's good. There you go. He, he passed away a few years ago, but um, he was a marvelous Man, he wrote some very good books. But this is it, right? We, we celebrate the weekend, right? It was Good Friday because he died, but it's Easter because he lives. And that Saturday in between, toggling between life and death and then death and then life, and now Easter comes. And so it's still the question, right? It's still the ultimate question. Who is Jesus? And what is his authority? And they're still asking that, not only in the first century, but in the 21st century. Except both in the first and the 21st, they're skeptical. Some hate him, and they hate us too. And they're angry with him, and they're angry with us too. But that doesn't really matter because this person, he's God, and his authority is total. Now, we believe that, but not everybody did. So John had to write and say, let me remind you all just who this one is, this only begotten son. Uh, he was in the beginning with the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And nothing came into being that came into being that didn't come into being through him. And because of that, John has been taking us on this, on this trek, saying you've got to believe in him. You've got to believe in his name. So from the beginning of the book to the end of the book, we've got to believe in his name. And everywhere in between, believe, 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 believe. 
So what do you have to do to become a Christian? Believe. And get baptized, right? No. 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 And promise to go to church, right? No. No. Uh, I was having breakfast yesterday with a guy who's the president of a of Dallas Christian College. Okay, so that's a former Church of Christ, Disciples of Christ his, history side. They're a little more not quite in that arena. But I asked him as he was uh, stuffing his face with a sweet roll. I said, "So tell me, what do you actually believe about Acts two thirty eight?" Then he swallowed his sweet roll. I said, "So I mean, like." Do you have to be baptized to be saved? Because isn't that what Acts 2 38 says? Lord, what must we do? Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sin. And so he said, baptism has a very high place. I said, okay, that's good, but do you have to be baptized to be saved? Well, there are some who think you do. I know there are. Am I sitting next to one? <laughs> so at any rate, I never got a good answer. However, we know the answer is belief. Believe in his name. So, John is taking us through, hold on, Bob. John is taking us through to help us understand what you got to believe. What you got to believe, why you got to believe, and how you got to believe. So, we've been focusing in on Jesus' public ministry. And we've got to the point where after the claims, all of a sudden there's some false charges that are being brought up against him. And so we're right there now, we'll be here for a while, because Jesus is bumping up against the religious leaders. He's met lots of people, the woman at the well, the men who came to the woman at the well, and the guy at the pool, and, and lots of other people. But all of a sudden, now he's meeting these folks. And these folks have a problem with Jesus, because real simple, Jesus dared to heal that guy on the Sabbath. Now that's bad enough. But he also claimed to be God. And with that, game over. And later we'll see want, they want to kill him for that. And he keeps telling them, but I am he. And unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sin. Now that's really how to make friends and influence people. Right? <laughs> so we've been looking at chapter 5, and we've seen that there was that miracle that took place. The man in the pool and stood up and walked. And then all of a sudden, the issue of Sabbath is introduced a number of times in the passage. And so, all of a sudden, there's a little bit given by Jesus of the meaning of this miracle. And then we begin to look at the message. It's a very long message. It's a very long speech by Jesus. The religious leaders needed to hear this speech. And so, this speech, it, it kind of got three parts to it, set off by amen, amen, amen. We've seen this before. Jesus begins to explain to them the situation uh, that even though he healed on the Sabbath, he's God, and in your God, you can do that kind of thing because the Sabbath was really a creation of God's. So, after that, and where we're going today, is Jesus is going to call for testimony. He's going to call for some testimony. They won't believe him, and so he's going to bring in some testimony to validate and verify his authority. Now, we know it's not going to work, but it's still something that we should focus in on. Now, we ended up last week um, in the story, verse 20 and 29, Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tomb shall hear my voice. And shall come forth those who did the good deed to the resurrection of life, and those who committed the evil to a resurrection of judgment. Remember, the Father has given all judgment to the Son. The Father has given the Son authority to judge. Jesus is God, and as God, he has been given authority to do all of this. But for some reason, these folks just don't want to listen. So Jesus is going to help say, okay, let me give you some testimony. Let me give you maybe a reason that you should listen to me. And this testimony is coming forth in the terms of a witness. Now, when you see a word or two repeated a number of times in a few verses, you should probably think that's important. So if you're reading through your tax forms and you see the word penalty more than once, you're paying attention, aren't you? And if you do this, penalty, 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 penalty. So you're focused on the penalty. 
Well, Jesus says, let's talk about witness, 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 witness. Let me give you a witness. Let me help you have evidence for a testimony of a witness. So we're going to see the witness. So this witness is going to come in a variety of ways, or a variety of uh, areas. So let's pick up the story in verse 30. And I can do nothing on my own initiative. Again, we're still in this speech. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And if I alone bear witness of myself, my testimony is not true. Now, wait a minute. He just said his testimony is not true. Well, in Judaism, both early and late, and this would be a little later, there was the view that said you can't bear testimony for yourself. That's not valid. And that's like going to a trial and you're on trial and you say, well, I'm testifying that I did not commit that crime. Well, yeah, of course, you've got self-interest. So give us some better evidence. So Jesus says, you know, if I only did this and bore testimony, you're not going to listen to it. And I can understand that. But Jesus said, ah, oh, but there's a little bit more of the testimony. Verse 31, if I alone bear witness to myself, my testimony is not true. There is another one. Who bears testimony or a witness of me? And I know that the testimony which he bears of me is true. Who is this person? You have sent to John, and he has borne witness to the truth. But the witness which I receive is not from man, but I say these things that you may be saved. He was a lamp that was burning and was shining, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his sight. John the Baptist was a witness to Jesus, right? Of course he was. Let's go back over to chapter 1. Look at chapter 1. You remember how John bore testimony. Verse 26 picks up the story. John answered them, saying, I baptize in water, but among you stands one whom you do not know. It's he who comes after me, the throne of whose sandal I'm not worthy. And these things took place in Bethany beyond the Jordan where John was baptized. And the next day he saw Jesus coming to him and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's called testimony. That's called witnessing. That's called proclaiming. This is he on behalf of whom I said, After me comes a man who has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. Look over at verse 35. Again, the next day John was standing with two of his disciples and he looked upon Jesus as he walked and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. That's called a testimony. It's called a witness. And Jesus says, hey, I don't have to just testify and witness to myself. You have somebody else. It's that baptizing guy that you all know, some of you love. And he came and said, you are, or that I am, the Lamb of God which should have informed you very quickly of all of your Old Testament theology about the land. But it didn't. It didn't really work on them too well. Back to chapter 5, verse 36. But the witness which I have is greater than that of John. For the works which the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I do bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. Ah, so John bore witness of what I, who I am, and the Father bears witness of who I am and what I do in my works. And the Father who sent me, he has borne witness of me, and you have ne neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form. And you do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe him whom he sent. So all of a sudden, Jesus says, well, let's up the end. And we've gone from, okay, I give self-testimony, but that doesn't count, no problem. John the Baptist, he preached, that doesn't count, no problem. The Father bears testimony of me, both now and later John, in John's account. But you know what? They just don't want to believe this, do they? They won't believe no matter what evidence. They won't believe no matter what testimony or witnessing. And part of the problem we know a little bit later from the writings of Paul is that the God of this world has done what? Blinded the eyes. Blinded the eyes of the who? Unbelieving. And that's why we, as Bob mentioned, we need to pray that God would open the eyes, 
right? He would illuminate. Paul prays that for the church. I pray that the eyes of their heart might be opened. He wants them illuminated. And that's why we pray for people, say, Lord, open their eyes. They can't see. That's why when we, we share the gospel with somebody, they just go ahead shaking their head. We go home shaking our head. Going, why can't they see it? Because they're blind. The God of this world has blinded the eyes of the unbelieving. That's why in terms of evangelism, we do share the gospel, but good night. It's a spiritual, supernatural event. So we should pray, Lord, open their eyes. All I can do is bring the message. It, it, the power is not in my voice bringing the message. I mean, you can have good voices, bad voices, but that's not where the power really is. The power is in the Word of God that God uses as the Spirit illuminates and opens up the minds of that unbeliever who's blind by the God of this world. And he can do a pretty good job of lying. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think we're watching a little bit of that take place in our own country these days, aren't we now? There's a little bit of magic dust being sprinkled out there, blinding people. And they're believing all kinds of stupid, crazy things. And they believe anything. Because as, uh, what, who was it? So basically asked, when you don't believe in God, it's not that you don't believe in anything. Uh, nothing. It's like you believe in anything. That's what people believe in. They believe in anything. Because it's on the internet. <laughs> yeah. Yesterday, I was at Barnes & Noble looking for a book and the few Christian books they have there. And for weeks, they have had, because I've been in there several times in the past few weeks, they have all these books on tarot reading and witchcraft and right as you walk in the door. So I said something to the woman. I said, that's just so interesting that you have all these books. And, the, you know, when you first walk in, she goes, e and she was a Christian, this woman. And she said, you would not believe the following that we have in the store of people who believe all that stuff. Uh, sure. It just made my heart just. Yeah, but you understand, it's always been this way. Yeah. It's never not been this way. They're, people have always been following stuff. Right. Maybe not as sophisticated as our stuff, but stuff. I mean, they followed it in ancient Greece and Rome. They followed it in every civilization. And nowadays, Christianity is the enemy. Mm -hmm. So they want to follow anything except Christianity. So Jesus is kind of calling on the Father to bear witness, and he did. But do you think they're going to listen to that? Well, now look at verse 39. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is these that bear witness of me. Remember the scripture. If you're a Jewish leader, you value the scripture and the law of Moses very highly. Why? Because it came from God. Wait a minute. If the Old Testament scriptures came from God... And Jesus says that the Father bears witness of him. He's saying the Old Testament bears witness of him. But you won't listen. You won't learn. Even though you search, you make a careful examination of, you investigate, you're careful to learn. You're not learning. They testify of me. And the Father gave you that Old Testament. But you won't listen to him. You won't listen to the Old Testament. You don't listen to, in fact, who wrote the big part of the Old Testament they like? Moses. And that's the problem here, right? Because of the Sabbath and Moses. They don't understand Jesus as Messiah. They don't understand Moses the Old Testament. They're not listening. They can't hear it. They're blind. But if they would have heard Moses, they would have been realizing that Moses said, there's going to come a prophet like me. Listen to him. And that's who this is, who's speaking to them. None other than the Messiah. No, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, but it's there that they bear witness of me. And of course they don't want to hear that. Verse 40, and you are unwilling to come to me that you might have life. Now, some translations say that you might have eternal life. Um, you know, that may be in there, may not. But at, at any rate, you don't want to listen to Moses in the Old Testament. It bears witness of me. But if you would have, you could have had eternal life, which is what this whole book is about. Right? This is John 1.12 again. This is John 3.16 again. 5.24 again. 20.31 again. That's what this book is all about. Believe, believe, believe. Believe in me and you can have the gift of eternal life. But you won't do it. You search the scriptures thinking you're going to find it. I'm the it. But you won't believe. 
I do not receive glory from men, but I know you, that you do not have the love of God in yourselves. Again, Jesus making friends wherever he goes. <laughs> you know, I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another shall come in his own name, you'll receive him. No problem. A new guy comes to town. You'll listen to him. He quotes Moses. Oh, we need to listen to this rabbi. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another? And you do not seek the glory that is from the one and only God. Whoa. Whoa. Identity, authority from the Father, from John the Baptist, from the works of the Son, the works of the Father, the proclamation of John the Baptist, you won't listen. You won't listen to each other. We, we live in a world today where people love to talk and communicate, right? I mean, you can be famous instantaneously if you have enough likes and people follow you. And, and, and everybody loves it. I mean, good night. You, 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 if you have a Facebook account, you get all these things come up on it and stuff. And, see all these people blogging and talking and just whatever, and going, who in that world wants to listen to this? Well, Fred, why are you reading this? Well, because I have to know them, so I read them. Go, why is this guy always talking? <laughs> they just want to be heard. Well, this is the way it's always been. And people want to get the glory and the honor and the, the whatever from everybody else. Tell them, oh, you're so wise and insightful. That's great writing, blah, 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 blah. And Jesus says, my gosh, what's wrong with you people? You, you look in the scriptures, but you're missing it because they're talking about me and you don't seem to get it. I come in my Father's name and you don't receive me. If another comes, you receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another? You don't seek the glory that's from the one and only God. Do not think that I will accuse you before the Father. The one who accuses you. Ooh, this is the knife in the, in the heart. The one who accuses you is Moses, in whom you have set your hope. You have set your hope on Moses and the Pentateuch and the Old Testament law. But don't you understand? They speak of me. Don't you understand? The Father gave you the law. He gave our fathers the law. And the law speaks of me. And the Father gave it. And you won't listen to either. You won't listen to the scripture, you won't listen to the Father, you won't listen to John the Baptist, you won't listen to anybody. You won't listen to any witness. You just won't listen. You just want your own. For, he says, don't think that I will accuse you. Moses is going to accuse you. For if you believed Moses, you would have believed me. For he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? What an indictment to the religious leaders. You won't believe the words of Moses. Remember, this is how this whole thing started. Jesus broke the Sabbath. He broke the law of Moses. And Jesus says, you don't understand the law of Moses. You don't understand who I am as the Messiah. He says... If you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? And notice Jesus uses two words here. The writings are the grapha, the graphite, the, the writings, written writings. But if you don't believe his writings of the Pentateuch, how will you believe my rhema? You've heard the word rhema? There's a Rhema Bible Institute in Oklahoma City, and I'm not endorsing it at all because they're a little strange. But the word is the word, Rhema. Jesus says, if you're not going to believe the writings of Moses, how will you ever believe the exact, pinpoint, precise, powerful Rhema of God? And, of course, they won't. So if the writings of that one you do not believe, how the words of me will you believe? It's put in a little chiastic structure, A, B, A, B. But no matter how you put it, you don't believe it. You know people like this? They, they hear, they listen, but they don't believe. You know, these folks should have gotten the big idea. Turn over to Luke, Gospel of Luke chapter uh, 24. 
Luke 24. It's uh, after Easter, and he's on the road, picks up a couple of guys who's saying, oh, we thought that Jesus just might be the one. And they bump into Jesus, who happens to be the one. They just don't happen to recognize him. Oh, we were hoping that maybe he would be the one. And Jesus decides not to show who he is for a while. He's playing. He's messing with them. I guess that's I, he's messing with them. But uh, finally, verse 27, And beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. The writings of Moses and the prophets. That's a big group of the Old Testament, isn't it? And then they approached the village and all sorts of interesting things happened there. But look at verse 44. Verse 44. And he said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which were written about me, where? In the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. I think we call that illumination. It's not the word illumination, but it's the function of illumination. He opened their eyes, their minds, to go, wait a minute, if we have this key, we can't get this door unlocked, we can't get what's behind the door, we hear it's a great thing behind the door. Finally, we have the key, turn the key, the lock opens, the door opens, now we get what Moses was talking about. Now we understand who the prophets were talking about. Now we understand what God was all about. It's all about him. It's all about him. It's what Moses wrote about. It's what the prophets spoke to. It's what the writings, the wisdom literature of Israel, all painted this beautiful picture of Messiah. But they didn't have the key. Luke 24, he finally gave them the key and they got it. But back in John 5, they didn't have the key. They couldn't see it. They wouldn't listen. They wouldn't hear. They just wouldn't come to know. So it doesn't really matter. Had all this testimony and they wouldn't listen. Does that mean we stop going? Stop proclaiming? Of course not. We keep going. Because people respond differently. The men at Sakar listened to the woman at the well. These religious leaders in Jerusalem didn't listen to the man at the pool. The woman and the man brought testimony of what Jesus did. The men of Sakar listened. The men, the religious leaders, they wouldn't listen. The men didn't allow the social mores to hinder them. They listened to this prostitute come and talk to them about Jesus. They listened. They believed. And then they evangelized. The leaders didn't listen because of religious mores, mosaic law, or their interpretation of it. Jesus told the woman, I am he. She said, I, we heard Messiah is coming. He said, I am he. Jesus told the religious leaders, the Father sent me. I am the Messiah. And they didn't listen. She listened and believed they don't believe. Hard hearts. So, it's all about who Jesus is. It's all about his identity. It's all about his authority. But these men were confused. They didn't understand Moses. They didn't understand the Father. They wouldn't listen to John the Baptist. They wouldn't buy into anybody's testimony. They had a preconceived view of their world. This is it. This is religion. This is how it works. Nobody else. Nothing else. Hard hearted people. So people are so concerned about their glory and their own life and how they look to each other that they fail to see the kingdom glory. They're confused. They're convoluted in their thinking. The epitome of this is Romans 1. They worship the creature instead of the creator. They turn to lesbianism and homosexuality and let's put in transgenders today and a few other things. That by the way, by just saying this and having this on an internet thing, how many months from now before this is called illegal? Okay? Mark it well. When's the day that this is called hate speech? 
When's the day that you can no longer say this without being put in jail? I don't know when that day is, I just know that day is coming. So, so far today, we're okay. But these people in Romans 1, when Paul wrote, they're confused. They're totally messed up. They don't understand anything. And God gave them over. God gave them over. God gave them over to the depraved mind. And we are living in a world that you're going to have to figure out what's going on in America. And I tend to think that we are getting ready to experience the judgment of God upon America because of the sin of America. Given all that we had at the beginning, the word, all that we had, morality, goodness, and we have so thrown it away and made it something to be hated. Well, I don't mean to bring up a controversial subject, but I'm going to. Um, then that means you mean to. I am really so touched and touched and at the same time so perplexed and bothered by what's happening at the border. It is what's happening at the, the border, border immigration. To see these children, it, it hurts my heart so bad I can hardly stand it. And then to see the other side of it, that people just literally, the people that are running our country do not care about these children, it is beyond my comprehension. Well, they, it, would, it, not, it is they just, would not say that they don't care about them. But they don't. Okay. You say they don't. They say they do. So we have a, I'm not disagreeing. I'm and, just saying. And the parents, too. I mean, who would throw their child away to the coyotes to have them come here? When nothing is going to change when they come here. We're well, just read, sitting in a detention read center. Read Romans 1 and you see the total confusion, no, the total death of the culture. Well, you see a shadow of a tree. You know there's a tree around somewhere. Right. We're seeing the shadows of the tribulation. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And we hope our pre triggers are right. <laughs> we are. Don't we are. worry. Okay. Sin says we are. We are. It's all good. I feel better now. Well, no, but if it's true, if it is true that, that we are experiencing the precursors of the tribulation, if it's true that we are going to go through things that are going to be very difficult, then we as Christians need to know how to deal with it. We need to know how you vote. We need to know how you think. We need to know methodologically what you do. Um, we need to know a lot of things. And a lot of people are looking for answers in a variety of interesting places. So what's the answer to racism, right? What's the answer to sexual identity, to marriage, to social justice, to government? Where do we find those answers? Well, I listened to Tony Evans yesterday. He said, we already have the answers. Yeah. They're in the book. Right. Right? They're in the book. They've always been in the book. But the church has stopped going to the book. And we're listening to a whole lot of other voices that, as I recall, are not inspired. They're not infallible. They're certainly not inerrant. And they're oftentimes stupid. But the church is listening to that. And so our leadership, which brings us back to our church, it's very important who the next pastor is because he is going to have to lead in a very different world than Grace Bible Church in 1960, yep. 1990, or 2000. This is 2020 in a whole new world, and now 2021, and we're seeing what that world's going to look like. And by the way, make no mistake, a large part of the evangelical church voted for this world order. Well, now talk about a controversial <laughs> so, Anyway, so you're, we're looking, what, when, what we're looking at in Jesus' speech and John's rec recording of it, we're looking at theology, right? We're looking at Christology, theology proper, who God is, Trinity. We're looking at soteriology, having faith in the Son. We're looking at eschatology, judgment. These are all theologies that we as Christians need to understand, which is one reason you have ABC, adult Bible class, right? That's why I'm not, I don't have a bunch of stories to give you a nice sermon. I don't even give nice stories and sermons, but what we need is not my nice stories. What we need is the authoritative word of God to guide us in all these things and stop looking somewhere else for those answers. This already tells us. And from a ministry's perspective, what's taking place here is apologetics 
and evangelism. Right here in the John 5. So the answer for us is in the Bible, and it's wrapped around theological truth that gets to be applied in the real world when we talk to people about Jesus. So Easter, um, we went to a different church. We stayed at home and watched First Baptist Dallas. And it was a marvelous experience. Preaching was wonderful. The music was just spectacular. Uh, everybody looked friendly, you know, from a distance as we were looking. Uh, it was wonderful. We had a great time. And, uh, and we didn't have to drive anywhere, which is even better. But in the afternoon, a friend of mine, a couple, a friend of mine from Virginia, gave my name to this friend of theirs that they had been sharing the gospel with, and she was Muslim. And so they gave her my name because she moved here. So we set up a deal where she would call me. So on Easter uh, late afternoon, she called. She's a Turkish uh, background. She's a Muslim. Uh, family's Muslim. Very pleasant, nice young woman. Uh, not belligerent at all. Very kind and loaded with questions. And so we talked about all kinds of things about the Trinity, about the deity of Jesus, the humanity of Jesus, the atonement, what that meant. Then she said, well, you know, I heard that Jesus really wasn't on the cross. That wasn't him. They took him off the cross, and they put some other guy and beat him up and threw him on the cross, and that's who died, not Jesus. Oh, and I'm like, whoa. And I'd heard this before. This is Islam's answer, right? And I said to her, I said, listen, you know, there's absolutely no evidence of that, and nobody even thought of that until 620 or 650 A.D., because it was brought up, you know, by Muhammad, not by anybody before that. And so we had this wonderful talk. I shared the gospel with her, and then we talked some more of their questions. We shared the gospel again, more questions and questions, and finally we kind of came to a natural point an hour later. And I gave her the name of a friend of mine who's a former radical Muslim from Saudi Arabia who's now a believer, has a ministry, a website, and he, in fact, we had him here to speak at a mission stand a couple of years ago, uh, Al Fadi. So uh, I connected her with him. And I've had a number of people who I've told this to, they're praying for this woman. But this is what we do. This is theology with apologetics to bring a witness, to bear testimony that we might do evangelism and share the good news. Amen. That's what we do. That's what it is. Whether it's Easter morning, Easter afternoon, whether it's with a Muslim, whether it's with a religious leader of the Jews, this is what we're to be about. And it all is wrapped around who is this guy? Who is this guy? And we're living in a world who doesn't like this guy anymore. They want to cancel Jesus. You get that? That's what this is all about. Yeah, they want to cancel Robert E. Lee and a few other people and whatever. I get that. But no, no. What they really want to do is cancel the bedrock of Western civilization. They want to cancel Christianity. And so they do it in a variety of ways. And by taking away his authority and taking away his identity and taking away statues, and he can't go to church. California, the church has won a victory. The Supreme Court overturned the local uh, Ninth Circuit, that conservative body of justices, <laughs> uh, saying that people can go to Bible step. So that's good. Cool. That's a victory. Anyway, that authority is going to be challenged over and over and over again, and we better get ready for that. We are going to try to pack the court. And uh, they'll, they'll pack the court. And we as Christians, as a church, we need to think better. So we need to demand, demand the time to think and develop the habit of thought. And that's what our class is for. That's what all these books that are around are for. That's what we need to invest a little bit more of our time doing. Well, the justification by faith is unpopular and very seldom taught because it takes away all merit man of. Exactly. In fact, this, this, this Muslim gal, she said, well, now, tell me, how much good work do I need to do? <laughs> oh, my. And I said, you know, I figured this would come up because of the background. I said, you know what? You know how much? Let me tell you exactly how much. None. None. <laughs> See, this is, grace isn't cheap. It's free. Mm -hmm. Well, but how good do I have to be then to get this? I said, not at all. Because it's not dependent on you. It's not what you do for him. It's what he did for you. That always comes up because people don't want a free gift, which means I'm, I owe somebody. I, I owe. I, I want to have a part of the deal so I can say, I helped. Just a little, but I helped. 
And God says, you didn't help at all. It's by grace, through faith, not by works. Right? Not by works. By works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Galatians 2.16. So, at the end of Easter... Jesus gives life to whom he desires. That's 521. Jesus has been given authority to be the eschatological judge. He's the recipient of honor. He's the resurrection life for the dead. And the life itself is in him. He will speak and the dead in their graves will listen. For he is the son of man to rule over all history. That's who he is. That's what we celebrate on Easter. That's who he is. That's his identity. That's his authority. And we don't need to be walking around, skulking around, feeling bad. No, 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 no. Those people are going to hell for all eternity. We're going to heaven for all eternity. Who's the winner in this thing? It doesn't matter if they win here, if they lose in eternity. So in one sense, the words of Jesus from the cross, Father, forgive them. They just are stupid. They don't know what they're doing. So I like the words of uh, Ed Clink. He says, this Jesus is the head of the church, the one through whom we pray and worship. The church is commanded to worship this God and the person of Jesus Christ and no other. While the world waits until the end of human history to acknowledge the Son of Man who is coming, the church acknowledges the Son of Man who is now, or now is. None of our kings, presidents, or prime ministers can compare our God, made known in Jesus Christ, is alone our king. Even as we respect the king of our land, we trust in a very different king. The true judge, and the only one who can give the good life and eternal life. Our love of God and our commitment to his message will be directly reflected by the degree to which Christ is at the center of all we do and say. You know, the king died a few days ago. 99 years old. Wow. He's dead. And all the other ones before him died. And the queens died. But we don't worship that king, that queen. We don't worship our president. We don't worship the Pope. And we don't worship any of that. We worship the risen Savior, which is what Easter is all about. So the only functional question is, will you be his witness? Because that's what this is about. Jesus says, now, we're the two of us. We still have the scripture. We've got the Moses law, the writings. But we have his word. We have the testimony of John the Baptist. The old land of God takes away the sin of the world. The question is, will we be the 21st century witnesses for that? So that's what uh, I think John would have us know, and I think that's what John would have us do. So let's pray. Father, we are grateful that you have given us truth we're grateful that you have given us a challenge. We pray, Lord, help us be witnesses. Help us be those who give testimony to your goodness, your greatness, your faithfulness, and to the gift that you give to people. So, Lord, we pray this week that you give us the opportunity, you give us the courage, give us the right words, and it might be your words, to share to a lost and dying person exactly what they need to know that they might have eternal life. We come and pray this in your name. Amen. Amen.